holy God who was and is and is yet to come. In the midst of a world that is changing almost hourly of protocols and guidelines of distancing and cohorting and engaging, we give you thanks and praise that your word, a reflection of you, remains timeless and true. We give you thanks that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path of how we live in 2020, our faith in our world around us. We give you thanks that your power through your spirit continues to unpack its truth for us, not just on a Sunday morning, but on a Thursday or a Tuesday, that you continue to ruminate your truth in, you, in us until it's accomplished everything that you have purposed for it. And so I pray this morning, Father, that my lips are, the words of my lips are pleasing to you, that their words are challenging and yet comforting in a time of trouble for us. We seek your grace. We seek your glory. We seek your truth. We seek your love. In your name we pray. Amen. My family has always loved to swim. And I'm okay with it, but there was a time that sort of set a place where I was not so comfortable with swimming. I remember very clearly I was at the Brantford, Ontario YMCA, just swimming in a recreational swimming time. There was a little diving board at the end of the pool that you could go off and jump off and swim to the side of the pool. And the rule was very clear that you didn't jump off the board until the person who had jumped ahead of you had already reached the ladder on the side. And I jumped off and jumped down. I wasn't a great diver, so I jumped down and I was coming back up. And as I was just about to hit the surface, I could feel the weight of the next person falling on top of me and driving me back underwater. Sputtering water inside my mouth and swallowing water and, and I clawing and panicking to swim my way up to the surface again. Clearly I made it. But to this day, I am not comfortable swimming in water given the panic and the fear that I experienced on that day where someone chose to break the rules. Now, the rules that God has given to us in Scripture lay out in Exodus 20 the Ten Commandments, which are summarized by Jesus in the sense of love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And then love your, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love that was around you. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 talks about God has plans for us to live in prosperity, in hope, in goodness, in relationship with Him and with each other. Now we live in a world though that doesn't always follow those rules. In fact, sometimes even rejects or rebel, rebels against them. And sometimes there's just things that happen to us. We've experienced in our world over the last few months the changing of how we shop, having to line up outside of a store to go inside and still not find any yeast or some other essential supplies that people have come to accustom to getting, to working from home, to learning from school at home and not being able to have graduations when you've left grade 12 or grade 9, or grade 6, or whatever the milestones are for some people. There's been a, a shifting of the rules of how we're supposed to engage each other with six feet apart, even family members. Mental health has become strained. Discouragement has grown. As jobs have become shuttered or diminished, debt has risen and, and increased. And our hope for our own survival has been shaken as the rules of the world around us have changed. Now the rules have, for others have remained the same for years, truly decades, centuries even. Rules that saw them treated as second-class persons, rules that saw them judged by sin, skin color or gender or age. Rules that imprisoned them culturally, 
socially, economically, and sometimes even physically. Rules that did not come from God, but comes from humanity, creation, where they saw one over another better than another. The rules were not meant to be lived fairly or justly in that environment. And those rules haven't changed like COVID-19. They have been in place systematically for centuries. The rules that were designed to guide our lives fairly, justly, lovingly have failed. They result in a chaos that's exhausting, exasperating, and expires many of our dreams and our desires. It creates frustration and fear and failure. We see peril, we see panic, and we see pain. We lose control, we lose order, we lose power. This chaos that that fills every sense of our being For some who've never had control are now trying to reassert control. And for others, it feels like they're taking away our control, a control that none of us really ever had because we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, we make efforts in the midst of this chaos to build our own kingdoms. It's like we would take God's light away and we would take out our own set of, say, blueprints to to plan out how we wanted to build our own little kingdom, if you will. And a blueprint is a drawing that that describes how what you want to create, how what you want to build fits into the scheme of things. And it also includes dimensions of the size and the amount of the quantities of materials that you need to create your project. But the reality is our own kingdom building our own efforts to create our own order our own control, our own power, ultimately always fail. If you're part of Maranatha's culture, our normal worship narrative includes a time of confession. And I've not skipped it this morning because it should never be missed or avoided because it's a recognition of who God is and who we are in connection with God. His, his laws, His rules, His decrees, His guide for how do we live in worship of Him and in love and service to each other. So we're going to move into a time of confession where we ask ourselves, where has the chaos impacted our lives and where have we been chaotic to others in the world around us? So I'm going to invite you for a few minutes. This is a bit unusual, I know, but we're in unusual times. To in your family groups, or if you're alone, just pray. To look at those two questions and see where the sin of chaos has engaged your world now. And at the end of this time, in about a couple of minutes or so, I'm going to begin a litany prayer that will also be on your screen that will guide us through a time of confession, recognizing these chaotic things that we have contributed into that has greatly impacted upon us. So begin your time of confession with one another as you discuss where chaos has hit you and where you were chaotic in the world around you.
I hope that was good for you. I would invite you to join with me in this prayer that leads us into God's grace. O Lord, our hearts are heavy with the violence of our world. So much suffering through the ages, wars and holocausts, genocide and abuse. We cry on behalf of our violent world, and I would invite you to join. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, you love and care for us as a parent. You came to share life with us as a brother. But we confess that we have failed to live as your children and instead have broken many bonds. We cry on behalf of our violent world. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, you have called us to live together in community, to consider one another as brother and sister regardless of ethnicity, economic status, or popularity. Yet we prejudice one another, refuse to love one another, and victimize one another. We cry on behalf of our violent world, Lord, have mercy. O Lord, giver of all life, you fearfully and wonderfully made us and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. Yet we endanger the lives of one another, abuse the lives of young children among us, destroy those who are defenseless, and oppress those who are powerless. We cry on behalf of our violent world, Lord, have mercy. God of justice, we lament the injustice we see around us. We lament the sin of racism in all of its pervasive forms. Forgive us for failing to live into the life that you have that you modeled for us, a life that enters into the suffering of others and offers healing and grace. We cry on behalf of our violent world, Lord, have mercy. In the sermon that we looked at last week, or last time, Pentecost Sunday two weeks ago, there was also chaos in the story. The power of the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers of Christ. There was 120 of them or so. And they began to praise God in different languages, languages that were not of their own. There were tongues of fire that appeared to be dancing on top of their heads. And the Jews in Jerusalem thought they were drunk, and the Jews in Jerusalem thought they were confused. But Peter stood up. This uneducated fisherman knew about the chaos of the world. Peter the denier, Peter the rebuker, Peter the sinker into the waves of the storm was also Peter who knew clarity, the clarity of Christ. Because only in Christ would the blueprints make sense. Because every blueprint has an architect that designs it. An architect that is one that signs off on the integrity of the structure, that everything makes sense when it's put together, and then when it's done, it is structurally sound and efficient and competent. Peter contends that the blueprints for the faith and the life of the people of God will be only found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And Peter speaks in Acts 2.42, and sorry, Acts 2.22, where he speaks into the history of the Jewish people, how the Messiah was promised to them, a Messiah who would save them and deliver them, a Messiah who would show them how to live as God's people, fulfilling the rules, the laws, the decrees, the guide of God himself to his people fully, faithfully, obediently, in love. A Messiah who would speak about a kingdom of majesty and mercy, a kingdom, a Messiah who would speak of a kingdom of grace and glory, of redemption and righteousness, a kingdom of love, a Messiah who would take all of the chaos in this world that had subjected people to suffering and slavery, if you will, of sin and human degradation and bring control and clarity from God back into creation. The Messiah, through his death on the cross, would make that very thing possible. And that's why we remember the cross and his crucifixion. The penalty of sin, death, was ours, but he took it upon himself. A death, a blood sacrifice, once for all. But also a Messiah who 
through his resurrection, would bring life, an abundant and full life, a just life, a shalom life, an equitable life, an equal life, a life not based on our expectations or on our merit, but on his presence, his providence, and his power. A Messiah who would make all things new. A Messiah who wasn't just a guide or a gimmick that you talked about, but one who dwelled within to reveal truth, to empower life. We spoke earlier of this confession of the chaos in our world. Part of the narrative at worship here at Maranatha is not just recognizing the confession of our failings, but also the glory of our being found by God. So I want to play this video for you that reminds us of just who we are in Him and for Him. Lord, the door cracks open to a new day and a new time. Fresh air and blue skies, faces we belong to see. You make all things new. It is not the same world we left, and it may never be again. But you are the God of restoration. You, O oh God, make a way in the wilderness, a river in the desert. Where we have turned away, Lord, we come back and pray for healing, for our land, for our people. We pray that you refresh our faith, our relationships, our communities, our purpose. We gather our courage, our hands will be strong, our voices will be loud, and we will carry the good news of your beautiful hope. As we step out, you are with us. Our work has just begun. Jeremiah 29, verses 12 and 13 speak about how the plans of God will be found when we seek Him. He will be found by us when we call on God's power, if we pray, if we seek God's face, His grace, with humility and hope, more than arrogance and ignorance of our own making, of our own blueprints, but a recognition that God and God alone makes things right in us and for us and through us. Acts 2, verse 40, Peter warned and pleaded with the Jews in Jerusalem to hear this message of the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, the hope of their life, to live together with God and with each other. And 3,000 people repented and believed and were baptized that day alone. And Luke 42, sorry, Acts 2.47 that Luke read speaks of how numbers grew daily as the word began to spread by the believers and the Holy Spirit's power, challenging people to hear this good news, this gospel of Jesus Christ, and to respond. The one God who was building the church is the one God who is empowering the church. Now, that church was, despite the differences of who they were, because the festival that was happening at Pentecost was a, a festival that the Jews from all the nations had gathered together. So the different nationalities there, different languages there, but they were all becoming one in faith and spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not uniform in appearance, but united in attitude. The text in, in Acts 2 speaks of the unity of the body of Christ. In verse 43, everyone was of one mind. And the text in 42 to 47 speaks of the word they, assuming everyone, was doing things together in learning of the disciples, of serving the needs of the poor, of worshiping God, of praying. All the separation found in the chaos of the world is united in the Christ who rules over the world. They are still different in their age, in their culture, in their class, and even the color of their skin, but they are one in Christ Jesus. They were one in sin, and now they are one in salvation. 
The text also speaks of this church, this growing church of being devoted. It says that in verse 42, the word in verse 46 where we speak of continue to meet together is the same word in Greek. It means they were devoted in their meeting together with God and with each other. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings. They were devoted in prayer. They were devoted in mission work. They were devoted in their new lives as followers of the Christ. The word devoted has a sense of persistence in it, of faithfulness. The English understanding of it means committed, focused, determined, resilient. There is an energy in being devoted. There is a power in being devoted. There is a surrender in being devoted, a commitment in being devoted to something, to anything. We see that in the world around us, whether it's in sports or, or athletes or in, in songs or in musicians or sometimes even school teachers or parents, where we recognize their power to help influence us and we become devoted into learning more about them and how they can influence us. There is a depth in the focus of the passion of this first church. And there was a focus in the depth of this passion that they, wanted, they were hungry to learn more of this God who was designing kingdom in them and through them. And they were united together in this faith, that together they sought who this Jesus was. Together they prayed to this Jesus. Together they worshiped this Jesus. And together they served on behalf of this Jesus. The clarity of this church is that it follows Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. It's Christ, and we belong to Christ, not the chaos. Now, next week, we're going to look at the church in more detail as we look at some of the people that are engaged in the church as we celebrate our grade six church school and their graduation from the church school into the youth group and the broader church. We're also going to celebrate the installation of office bearers, the new office bearers that are some of whom are brand new to the church. We also get to celebrate the, the baptism and the profession of faith of Megan Jones and Tristan's bap and ba his baptism as well. We get to celebrate the people of the church next week, as well as the Lord's Supper, where we remember the Christ who knits all of this together. In the following weeks, we're going to unpack more of what God's blueprint for the church looks like, the parts of the church, especially how it affects us here at Maranatha CRC, how our Vision 2020 looks at the various ships of how we organize and structure and lean into our church and how that structure leans out into the world around us. A church that has been designed by God, purposed for God, and empowered by God for His kingdom. Christ did not promise to remove us out of the struggles of our world, the racism, the chauvinism, the inequality of injustice, of poverty, and the other inequalities that we live in. And He didn't promise us that we wouldn't be challenged to give more and to receive more grace. But He did say that He would be on His throne, guiding and directing, empowering and enabling His church to be His hands and His feet, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, the fragrance of Christ Himself, and the will of God the Father lived out in us and for us and through us. In the midst of this broken world, not just with COVID-19, but for decades and centuries beyond, we are still God's people, His church. And I want to end this time before we pray with this. It happened, the unthinkable, the shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated, we are isolated, and in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too, 
But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but none the less. We are strong. We are courageous. We are the church.